Succeeding real estate's most competitive asset classes, value-add multifamily residential properties. My guest today, Max Sharkansky, managing partner at Tryon Properties, is a successful repeat user and strong real estate investing. Welcome to the National Real Estate Forum podcast, episode 219. Thank you for joining me today. I am Dr. Adam Gower, and this is the Crowdfund Project at nreforum.org, where developers, investors, and industry leaders share insights that you can use to raise capital, build wealth, and earn passive income from crowdfunded real estate deals. In all the online and offline training to investors and sponsors that I give about how to raise capital or invest in crowdfund real estate deals, the first thing I like to talk about is the fact that real estate is a cyclical industry and that prices will come down at some point. The message is, of course, that if you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs, to quote Kipling, then you can stay ahead of the crowd, to quote me. But it's the crowd, to quote me. But it's very difficult to predict a market downturn and takes a lot of courage to exit when the market seems to be charging relentlessly upwards. For a sponsor, it's easy to get caught up in the idea that this time it's different and to want to continue to build to keep their development machine in operation. For investors, there is always the fear of missing out. I was talking to Draw Pollock, who is a seasoned private equity guy, about how private equity finance works and the impact of crowdfund real estate on that industry for a future podcast when the subject of cycles came up. His advice to avoid the hard lessons of real estate is to invest with the macroeconomic trends, i.e. ride the wave up and get out before it crashes down. Well, that sounds easy. But when you are on a run and everything is looking good, it's really difficult to get out of the market, especially when everyone around you just keeps chugging along. In the online course on how to invest in crowdfund real estate deals that I'll be launching in the next two, three weeks, I get into detail on not only how cycles function, but also how to detect an impending correction. To find out more about, please go to the show notes for today's episode at the National Real Estate Forum.org website, nreforum.org forward slash max, and I will send you a summary of what and where crowdfund real estate comes from and how it can benefit you. That's nreforum.org forward slash max. My guest today is Max Sharkansky, Managing Partner at Tryon Properties. I met Max over 10 years ago, right at the very depths of the last market downturn. They were very turbulent times and Max had had the foresight and courage to get out of the market before the crash. Since then, he's done as every successful entrepreneur has to do. He's adapted as the market has ebbed and flowed and his early adoption of crowdfund real estate has put him ahead of the field and helped him build his company to considerable scale. Be sure to check out the show notes to today's episode by going to the nationalrealestateforum.org website, nreforum.org forward slash max, for links to Max's company, as well as to more information about Max himself. We're in the business of value-add multifamily. We started out in 05, 06. Prior to that, I was a broker at Marcus and Millichap. My partner, Mitch Paskover, was working on the debt side at HFF uh, in mortgage banking. We started buying towards the end of 05 while I was a broker at Marcus. I was brokering multifamily in the San Fernando Valley at that time. So naturally, we started buying multifamily in the San Fernando Valley. That's where I had access to off-market deals, market knowledge. And then from there, it just snowballed. We bought those two in 05, bought a few more in 2006. And then at the end of 06, we left and we opened up our own shop. We continued, we continued to buy. We bought through the last cycle in 05, 06, 07. Uh, we sold most of our portfolio in 08 prior to the crash. Uh, we saw what was happening with Mitch being in the capital markets, uh, myself being in the transactional markets, our properties in prior to the crash. Uh, We saw what was happening with Mitch being in the capital markets, uh, myself being in the transactional markets. Our properties in portfolio started to tick up in vacancy, tick down in rents. We we saw what was happening and we sold in 08. As we were selling in 2008, we changed our acquisition strategy from value-add multifamily because you can no longer make that model work to targeting non-performing debt secured by multifamily. At that time in 08, there was a log jam in the market and you really couldn't make anything work. Lenders wanted to sell non-performing debt at 90 cents on the dollar, irrespective of the value of the underlying real estate. And you know we were looking at it based on the value of the underlying real estate. So we 
bought our first few notes in 2009, uh, which is actually how you and I met. It is, and isn't it? Did you buy anything for me, or was I selling too high? <laughs> you were selling too high. You were doing too good a job. I bought, and from there, it snowballed, and we did about 20 deals during the downturn in 9, 10, 11, 12, uh, about 15 of which were note deals and five just REOs. And we had a fully built out management infrastructure. So where a lot of our competitors were buy the note, foreclose, sell, because we were operators, we were buy the note, foreclose, renovate, lease up, and then sell. And that was that, that model and that infrastructure allowed us to buy some REO product as well. Uh, and then coming out of the downturn in 2012, we just went back to the value add business. And we are currently have approximately 18 properties in portfolio, 17 with the 18th in escrow. Our aggregate portfolio value is around $240 million. We have a gross track record of over $300 million and over 40 deals. Okay, so let's talk about how you've been financing your growth. Going back record of over $300 million and over 40 deals. Okay, so let's talk about how you've been financing your growth. Going back to 2005, 2006, through the downturn and before the Jobs Act became relevant. How were you financing in the good old days and how has that changed? It was the wild, wild west, <laughs> especially during the downturn. We grew very organically. We bought our first few properties with our own capital. Uh, we were both pretty strong producers at our firms at the time, so we saved a couple bucks and bought our first few properties. Then we started to syndicate out to friends and family and colleagues, Mitch to some of his HFF folks, me to some of my Marcus folks, and it grew very organically. During the downturn, it became extraordinarily difficult to raise money so we bought a lot of stuff with just high octane debt and our own capital. And then as we got a little bit further along and we... And how were you raising it then? That was still from friends and family, was it? It's all, yeah, it was all friends and family, referral based. We met some family offices that were able to write larger checks and a lot of high octane debt. So, you know, we would, we would buy notes with other debt. We would put debt on debt. Right. And uh, that was very helpful in allowing us to close. All right. So what brought you to crowdfunding? How did you even hear about it? I heard about it just like everybody else through the news with the Jobs Act passing and everything that was supposed to come of that. And then when it rolled out in real estate, you couldn't help but see it because it was in Globe Street, every other major news publication. It was in your face. You know, if you're in the industry, it was in your face. So we started calling around. We did some deals with Real Crowd, Realty Mogul, Realty Shares. And they've all been great. They've all been great to work with, and uh, they've all been very successful. And it has been a very large boon to our business. It's definitely allowed us to access capital that we wouldn't otherwise have had access to. And it has allowed us to supplement equity capitalizations when we very much needed the capital. So describe the process a little bit of uh, what it takes to raise money for a crowdfunded deal. That's different from the friends and family route. Well, first of all, there are two crowdfunded deal. That's different from the friends and family route. Well, first of all, there are two models, right? There's let's call it the LLC model, which would be like Realty Mogul and Realty Shares, where you interface with them directly. It's more like dealing with almost like dealing with an opportunity fund. You interface with one originator, call it uh, a deal guy. And they vet the deal, they vet you as a sponsor, they do a walkthrough, they do their own underwriting. There's a lot of Q&A back and forth, not dissimilar from an opportunity fund. And you never interface with their investors, and that all happens behind their own curtains. I don't know who they are. I don't interface with them before the acquisition. I don't interface with them after the acquisition when we're operating. It's all done with the companies. Then the other model is more of the technological platform model, if you will which is like real crowd and crowd street. And in that model, you're effectively paying right. And they still do vet you. And, you know, you go through the process and you post a deal on the site and you pay them a flat fee, not a percentage of how much they raise. And you interface with the investors directly. So they're all, they're contacting you based on the posting, based on the materials, uh, having a lot of dialogue, Q and a, I've met people on site at properties 
Um, I have people that I met. We did our first property raise through RealCrowd in 2013, I think it was, and we have investors who have been with us since then in multiple deals. So either model works very well. So going back to the LLC model, what you described as the LLC model, almost like a fund, they really are your primary contacts, and it's almost as though they are the ones investing in you from what you've described. Do they take any kind of control or do they leverage control over your management operations and the operating agreement in any different way than the strictly than the strictly marketplace websites? Yes, they do. Uh, and that also depends on what portion of the equity they're taking. So, you know, if someone's taking, if we've got a deal with a huge check, 10 million plus, and they're taking a million and a half, they're really not going to have much input into the operating agreement. If we're raising $4 million and they're taking 2.1, then they're absolutely going to have some input on the operating agreement. Again, not dissimilar to an opportunity fund or any JV type partner that would go in and mark up the operating agreement. We go back and forth and we come to a final. Okay. And do you have a preference one formula over another? And if so, why? No, we don't have a preference. There's a time and place for both. And we have used both very successfully. It, you know, with regards to other sponsors, it really just depends on your business as a sponsor and how you want to grow it. And what you want depends on your business as a sponsor and how you want to grow it and what you want at that time. If you want, if you have, you have a deal and you're stretched thin, and you don't want the brain damage of talking to a lot of people, and, or I shouldn't even call it brain damage, you just don't have the time, you don't have the bandwidth, then go and do the LLC model. So you interface with one person, and they raise the money for you, you pay them for it, and you're done. If you have a business where you're very much trying to grow out your Rolodex of high net worth investors, and, that, and you have made the conclusion that that is the way you want to grow your business over, for years to come, then try the marketplace model you will get investors and you keep them. They become your investors. Now, the LLC model, what kind of marketing do you have to do? You, do you do any marketing at all with that? Or is that strictly the, the marketplace model? Or do you do any marketing at all when you do these things, when you um, issue these offerings? A webinar to discuss the investment and give the investors an opportunity to dial in and listen to the dialogue and the Q&A about the investment. And then they can submit their questions at the end of the webinar, which is an effective marketing tool. But beyond that, us as the sponsors, we're not doing much of the marketing. Okay. So you're relying on the platforms to do the marketing for you. Correct. And do any of the platforms guarantee the raise? Uh, in other words, no. they back it up with their own funds and guarantee you're going to do it and then they try mm. and backfill? I think it's now evolved into that. I can't speak too much detail on that because mm. we've never done that with any of the platforms where they've guaranteed us a certain amount, but I think that is now out there. I think uh, Fundrise, who is, you know, they're in that like preferred equity mez space, they do guarantee a certain amount, but that's a little bit of a different business. And what are the terms like, Max? Now, but that's a little bit of a different business. And what are the terms like, Max, in comparison to the old days, uh, or working with a private equity fund, for example? What are the terms like? Well, I think what's great for investors is with the internet and crowdfunding and all these different platforms, there's a lot more transparency. So some of the more egregious terms that you would see in the old days aren't really out there as much anymore. Like for our, we pretty much have a cookie cutter approach on pref and promote for the most part. We take 70, 30 after an eight pref and that's worked. Some sponsors charge a little bit more. And no waterfall? No. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Some will do a waterfall, but we keep it simple. Okay. No waterfall. We don't charge an asset management fee because we self-manage. So that's enough fee income for us to get by and pay the bills. Some people uh, will outsource their management, so they do get the case. And again, there's no necessarily right or wrong way. There's a very broad spectrum of how to operate. So I'm interested in this idea that you've articulated that it's, more transparent than it used to be and that egregious terms have gone away because of that. Can you talk to that a little bit more, please? Sure. Uh, I think, you know, back in the olden days, you would see much lower preferred returns 
much higher promotes. I've back and when I started in the old cycle, wouldn't be uncommon to see fifty fifty after a six. And I think in this day and age, that's a thing of the past. It's a relic because people have transparency and they have a window into what other sponsors are charging and what is quote unquote market. So I don't think, you know, in this day and age, unless it's like a fix and flip of some sort and very, very small, I don't think you're really going to see 50-50 after a six. And what about operating terms and management controls? Have, have those... At the end of the day, if you're doing a syndication, then you have to have controls. You might see a little bit, you know, with, with some of the crowdfunding groups and, you know, the LLC model, if they have a substantial portion of the equity, if they've got... 60% or more, 70% or more, they might have some controls uh, as they should because they own so much of uh, the asset. Typically, how much skin do you put into these deals? We're putting in 5 to 10%. Okay, so that's fairly standard Yep. Uh, formula, right? Sure. All right, do you want to talk about uh, Fremont a little bit? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, tell me about the Americana, yeah. So we are buying, we actually just closed on and are backfilling via Realty Mogul, 88 units, in Fremont, California, uh, which is in the East Bay in the Bay Area. Uh, many people have heard of Fremont because it is the home of Tesla auto manufacturing. Tesla is one of the hottest cars out there, and uh, it's a rapidly growing car company. And because of that, there has been an extraordinary amount of growth in Fremont, uh, not just because of Tesla, but also because of AMD, some of the other local employers. Uh, if, you look at, uh, if you look at it on a map, it's the gateway to Silicon Valley. It's essentially the first exit on the freeway before you get to Silicon Valley in the East Bay. So very strategically located. Um, it's got an, a lot of overflow from Silicon Valley and the peninsula. So we love the market and we love everything about the real estate. With regards to the asset itself, it presents an incredible value add opportunity. We This is very typical of what we buy, legacy ownership. We bought it from the family that bought it from the original developer in 1966. So their basis is nothing. The debt is nothing. They've been operating it for occupancy, essentially, for many, many years, decades. And there hasn't been much capital put back into the asset. So this falls, into, this falls right into what we do. And uh, that is buying legacy assets that are tired, will $25,000 a unit on interiors, fully upgrading the interiors. We're tearing everything out. We're putting in brand new kitchen cabinetry, high gloss, very European looking, uh, quartz countertops, stainless steel appliances, faux wood, vinyl plank flooring, washer dryer in every unit, uh, which is a huge selling point. People love that. All new fixtures, all new finishes in the bathrooms, tubs, vanities, just a brand new unit. And we can deliver those units to the marketplace 25% below what a renter would be paying for a brand new Class A property. So very strategic place in the market for those assets. What else can I tell you? We are stabilizing it at a low 6% cap rate on cost. Our thesis is that we'll be able to exit that five years from now at a high four cap, uh, which is where properties there are trading now, about 475, four and a half is that we'll be able to exit that five years from now at a high four cap, uh, which is where properties there are trading now, about 475, four and a half, 475. We will grow the rent uh, you know, very organically at that point uh, after we stabilize it two and a half to 3% annually. We underwrote it to a five year hold at roughly 19 IRR. 20 IRR, I think it's like 19 and a half, and investor level, it's mid-teens IRR, like 17 IRR. So very strong piece of real estate, very strong risk-adjusted return. So what are the key numbers, Max? Uh, how much are you paying? How much is it going to cost you? How much are you raising? Uh, what kind of terms are you giving to the investor? We paid $26.5 million for 88 units. That's $300,000 a unit and 300 bucks a foot because they're uh, primarily, the average unit size is right around 1,000 square feet. The price per pound is one of the lowest that has a couple of years. Uh, 300 bucks a foot, I believe, actually is the lowest. So we're excited about that. With regards to structure with our investors, it's exactly what I discussed earlier. 70-30 after an eight. We do not take an asset management fee. We self-manage. So we take a property management fee and we have our own crew. 
so we take a construction management fee also. We're raising $10.5 million. Most of it is subscribed. We're backfilling about another million and a half or so. So uh, we had a very successful raise. We started a little bit late while we were in the contract period. And that's why we just have a little bit extra to raise, which my partner and I closed with our own capital. And we're now backfilling. Don't forget to pick up your free PDF summary to crowdfund real estate and how you can benefit from this industry at the show notes for today's episode at the National Real Estate Forum.org website, nreforum.org forward slash max. Forward slash max. Okay, so what are the pros and cons for somebody thinking of either floating a deal like this on a crowdfund platform or investing in a deal like this? Pros and cons. Well, the pros, I think, are just everything that I just went through, you know, with just phenomenal opportunity for job growth in the area, rent growth, appreciation of asset value, ultimately, uh, is what it's all about, and operating cash flow. What's your, what's your lowest uh, investment? Oh, well, I don't know. So I'm sorry, I shouldn't say that. It was 50000 direct when we were doing a direct raise, but I'm not sure what it will be on Realty Mogul because they take smaller chunks usually. Direct raise is when you were doing it yourself, is it? Correct, correct. Uh, okay, so you did a direct raise and then you went to Realty Mogul to backfill what you were short, is that right? Correct, that's correct. Okay, and has that been... No, we've done a couple that way. It really just depends how things shake out with the raise. This was a very large raise for us. Ten and a half million dollars is a pretty large raise to syndicate out with, you know, fifty to two hundred thousand dollar checks. Um, we did have a few larger investors that took up some allocation, but we weren't able, we weren't quite able to get there by closing. So my partner and I put in the shortfall, and now we're backfilling it. Oh, I see. And then do you find that the crowdfund websites are more efficient in terms of the process? I mean, why didn't you go for the full raise on the Realty Mogul? Oh, I don't think that most of that, there aren't really any crowdfunding groups out there yet that can raise 10 million plus. Otherwise, I would have been happy to do it. I see. And is the process faster? How long did it take you to raise the eight and a half and then how long to backfill the one and a half? Uh, it took us about 45 days or so to raise the eight and a half, or actually nine, it was nine, it take a few weeks for them to execute. Are they, are they very they, efficient. Are they more efficient than you are, do you find? It's a different business, right? Like they're in the business of raising capital. So I would say, yes, absolutely, they're more efficient than we are, as they should be. That's their main line of business. And how many investors do you have on both the, uh, uh, again, just in, tip, in general terms, Max, on, uh, on a raise like this, where you've got nine million that you've raised, and they are out there raising a million, million and a half. Well, I don't know how many will be in their entity, but we have roughly 20 to 25 investors. Okay. And in past experience, do you find that uh, working with a crowdfund site, there are more investors? You never know. You just, I don't know what they're going to, how many investors they'll have in their entity, but you know, with the marketplace crowdfunding platforms, we usually get call it like seven to 15 for a given deal, seven to 10 and maybe. You, and then you meet, you meet them, meet them as in, you know who they are after the close. Oh yeah. I, no, no, no. I usually meet them before the close. I mean, and it can be something as simple as a few emails or sometimes I've had them come to my office. There have been times where I've met them on site at the property, if it's in LA or uh, if the property is, let's say in the Bay area and they happen to live in the Bay area, it runs the gamut. And what kind of Look, you went through a downturn and you did well out of the downturn. How are you insulating your portfolio now against what inevitably will be the next downturn? Don't say that. Be more optimistic. <laughs> <I'm> just <kidding. laughs> of course, it's uh, just going to keep on going up. Exactly. Uh, yes, I wish. Um, I think that one of the things that we do that really helps us hedge risk is low debt. Um, we're not putting an extraordinary amount of debt on our properties. Fremont is an example. We're levered to about 68, 69% of cost. Cost. Okay. And then, you know, so we'll take 68, 69% at closing and then the lender will fund the rest as we're improving the asset. And then once we refi out of it, we'll be right around the same leverage at 65 to 70%, maybe even a little bit less than 70, probably more like 65 to 67, 68% of 
the new value based on the increased NOI. Now, is that a decision that you make, the level of leverage, or is that bank-driven, or is that platform-driven? That's a decision that we make internally. We try not to squeeze every last dollar out of it, because if there's a hiccup, that's how you get hurt. Exactly right. Real estate won't kill people. Debt will kill people. Exactly right. It'll, uh, that's I'm what sorry. we saw during the downturn. Uh, Absolutely. Excess, an excessive leverage. That's right. Um, do you recommend crowdfunding to other developers? I would recommend it. I think you'd be crazy not to do it, whether you're a young sponsor or an old sponsor. Funding to other developers? I would recommend it. I think you'd be crazy not to do it, whether you're a young sponsor or an old sponsor. I've seen you know, groups who have been around for a few years doing it. I've seen groups who have been around 25 plus years doing it. It is a phenomenal supplement to your investor base, and you're crazy not to do it. It's a win-win-win for all involved. Have you invested in any deals that are not yours on other websites? No, I have not. I have not. We only we're 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 pretty young guys, and but I would not. All right, good. So, uh, do you have anything in the pipeline at the moment or in the on the horizon? No, we have something in contract right now, but it's already fully capitalized. Nice. <laughs> okay. And how have you capitalized that one? So we have a fund as well that we launched last year, and that fund has eight figures in it. Um, we're raising a couple million more. And so we've got, uh, it's a small equity check. I mean, it's, you know, five, six million bucks. It's around five million bucks. So we're raising two, we're going to put in two and a half out of our fund. And then we have one high net worth investor who uh, took the rest. And is that uh, blind, blind pool? Well, it was blind pool going in. At this point, anybody who invests will be able to see five of the assets in the fund. And we're only buying one or two more at this point because we're nearing the end life of the fund or end the end period of the investment period. So it's at this point, if you're investing, you're, if you're investing, you're investing more so into a portfolio than a blind pool. And is that something that you can do on a crowdfunded website or is that something you do separately? Correct. We do, uh, I should say the former. Yes, we do it on a crowdfunded website. We've done it on, we have it on real crowd. We have it on crowd street. Realty Mogul is actually going to launch it in a couple of weeks. So yes. So it's a fund, uh, is it, with a uh, with a with an investment thesis rather than individual deals? Is that how you do that on a crowdfund platform? That's correct. Fun. Well, we have, I mean, we have, we're very niche investors, right? We are not jack of all trades, master of none. We don't buy five di- two different asset classes all over the country. We're buying value-add multifamily, 60s and 80s vintage primarily, 60s through 80s vintage, in four markets. We're in San Diego, LA, Bay Area, and Portland. Fremont, uh, as an example, went into the fund. We wrote a $2.5 million check out of the $5 million check uh, coming out of the fund and going into that. And then our investor will be taking the balance of the allocation. I see. So the fund is uh, a single investor in some of these deals, a partial investor in some of these Correct. deals. Correct. Correct. It's, like it's almost like a GP fund. Interesting. And the same kind of terms? On the fund, it's seventy five twenty five, okay. and after an eight percent pref with a catch up. And how does that balance when you invest that into a deal that's like Fremont that has different economics? That we rebate the fund. Any so a, we do not double promote our fund or any of our investors. We find that to be which it's just not something that we do. Mm-hmm. So any promote that's taken on the property level or any fees that aren't in the fund docs, say, for example, a construction management fee, which we have in Fremont, but we don't have in the fund docs, will rebate towards the fund. We don't have in the fund docs, will rebate towards the fund. I see. That's an interesting structure. Is that, I mean, it's, you know, it's not a simple structure. I presume that you find some of your investors are relatively new to real estate. Would that be accurate? Yes, yes, it would. Um, but the rebating is, yeah, it's actually not that complicated. So if, let's say, for example, our fund has $2.5 million of a $10 million equity check, that's 25% of the equity. So when the deal realizes and we go to get a promote, we'll not charge the fund 25% of the promote. So okay, fairly I- straightforward. Do you find you have to explain real estate concepts to your investors very much, or are they just primarily looking at returns? What's, what's their key driver, do you think? 
Well, I don't, we really don't have to explain real estate concepts. It's a fairly straightforward business. It's the business of. Well, I don't, we really don't have to explain real estate concepts. It's a fairly straightforward business. It's the business of apartments. So, you know, we take an older apartment, we fix it up, we make it like a newer apartment. We go into the details of all that, uh, as I did earlier on the call, and they understand. It's not rocket science. It isn't rocket science, but when you're a rocket scientist, it seems easy, right? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's right. Well, we try to keep it as layman as possible. As a real estate guy, what are the key daily habits that you have to make your business successful? I think one of the big ones over the years has been less focus on every little intricacy of the deal itself and working on a deal and on every micro detail of an acquisition and growing into more of it and building out a strong acquisitions team and building out a phenomenal operations team and a project management team and an accounting team. And like any other industry, any other business, it's all about your team. This business is not about me and my partner anymore. We've grown way past that. It's all about our team. So that is the most important thing in our business. Okay, my second question. What has been the hardest lesson you have learned in real estate? <clears throat> the hardest lesson, capitalization. And that comes back to what we were just discussing. Real estate doesn't kill people. Debt kills people. Fortunately, it's not something that I've had to learn much firsthand. We've never lost a property to foreclosure. We've never had any issues with any of our lenders. But, you know, we saw the carnage. We were, as I said, in, we were on the other side of that carnage. So we understand how a perfectly great deal, a perfectly great piece of real estate and great opportunity can be destroyed with poor capitalization. Okay, and then number three, if you could give one piece of advice to somebody who is not yet invested in real estate but is thinking about it, what would it be? As a limited investor? Yeah, as, a, as an investor on a uh, crowdfund platform. As an unsophisticated, yeah, yeah sure, sure. Somebody is a first-time investor on a crowdfunding platform, I would suggest that you thoroughly vet the sponsor's track record and you thoroughly vet what types of fees they're charging on the deal to ensure that you, as an investor, have an alignment of interest with your sponsor. So if you see that your sponsor is charging extraordinarily higher fees, and when I say fees, I mean just that fees, acquisition fees, placement fees, exit fees. If you see that the fees are significantly higher than the other sponsors in the crowdfunding world that you're seeing, then you might want to think twice about doing that deal. If they have a extraordinarily higher promote, than somebody else. You might want to think twice about that, but more so with the fees because there should be an alignment of interest. Like our ethos is if our investors make money, we make money. Otherwise, what's the point? My favorite line from Max today is his comment that it is not real estate that kills people. It's debt that kills people. Never has a word been more spoken in truth. When I was working through billions of dollars of deals during the last downturn, the term that was most misused was that it was distressed real estate. It wasn't distressed real estate. The real estate was just fine. It was the layers of debt on the real estate that was in distress. The same idea is echoed by Glenn Muller, one of my guests from Series 1 of the podcast. When asked what are the most important in real estate, Professor Muller unhesitatingly steers clear of the novice's cliched location, location, location response and instead states that quality buildings with good tenants and low leverage, is the key to success in real estate. I could not agree more. The next podcast will be with Sarah Hanks, co-founder and CEO of CrowdCheck. CrowdCheck provides due diligence, disclosure and compliance services for online capital formation. She helps investors get the information they need to mitigate risk of fraud and to make informed investment decisions. And she helps entrepreneurs and intermediaries avoid liability. Sarah is another guest with a fabulous accent, so be sure to tune in, if even only just for that. You can subscribe to the series on whatever platform you listen to podcasts, 
at the nationalrealestateforum.org website, nreforum.org, and hitting any of the links that I've included about halfway down the homepage. Thanks for tuning in on the homepage. Thanks for tuning in, and thank you also to Max Sharkansky, Managing Partner, Tryon Properties, for sharing your... Until next time, this is Dr. Adam Gower, signing off.